Kia ora, I'm Julianne Gento. I'm the Transport Spokesperson for the Green Party of Aotearoa in New Zealand. I want to tell you about the campaign that we have to create a smart green transport system so we can reconnect Auckland. In Auckland, at the moment, most people need to drive to get most places, right? Does that seem true to you? It's costing us a whole lot of money. Now, local government in New Zealand spends about a billion dollars on transport a year. And that all comes from our rates. Um, central government is spending about three billion dollars a year. So all, and that's coming from road user charges and petrol taxes. So again, it's all our tax money. So local government, central government are spending um, on, together four billion dollars a year. But households and business are actually spending a lot more than that. Households and business are spending more than $10 billion a year on vehicles and fuel to run them. That doesn't even consider the cost of parking, which might be another $10 billion in land that's tied up in underutilized car parks. Um, so this is our oil bill. This shows our oil imports. The blue line shows that actually we haven't increased the quantity of oil over about the ten, last 10 years, not much. But the red line shows that the value of it has gone way up and we've been spending over $8 billion a year importing oil. And as some of you may know, we, we produce oil here in New Zealand, but it's not the sort of oil that we put into the tanks of our cars. It actually gets shipped overseas because it's light, sweet, and crude, and we don't even have the refining capacity. So even if we had a big oil find in New Zealand, highly unlikely that it would make any difference to the international price that we pay when we import oil. And vehicles, you can see the number of vehicles that we're importing has actually declined a bit, although again, the value is still over three billion. So last year we spent over 11 billion on vehicles and fuel. And of course, we still have really bad congestion. Sometimes. It's pretty easy to get where you need to go if you travel late at night or early in the morning, right? So we have enough roads the problem is that we have too many people using the roads or trying to use the roads at the same time. And that's because cars take up a lot of space. So the space needed for 60 people traveling in a car is significantly greater and more likely to result in a traffic jam than 60 people traveling on a bus or on bikes. And Auckland used to have really great public transport. This graph goes all the way back to 1925, um, and this pink line shows the number of public transport trips. Now that's not per capita, that's total. So in the 50s, in the 40s and 50s, you could go anywhere you wanted to on the Auckland Isthmus, um, even some parts of the North Shore, uh, on electric trams, or you could take the ferry. But after we took the electric trams out, public transport use plummeted. Even though the population was steadily increasing, Public transport use didn't really do much. And then here in the early 90s, we took off the import duty on secondhand cars, and uh, we privatized the bus companies, and patronage plummeted. But as oil prices have been rising, and congestion has been getting worse, and we've been investing in public transport, we've seen some increase. But it's still pretty low relative to this giant population we have. So is it because New Zealanders love their cars. Aucklanders just love their cars so much they will not take public transport. Or is it for some other reason? Human activities necessarily result in vehicle trips. Does that sound right to you? No, actually this was traffic engineers. So if you look in uh, the Waitakere City uh, District Council plan, which you know, now it's been amalgamated into the super city, and you looked at the driveway and parking guidelines, which shaped decisions about how development happened in Auckland, one of the first lines in it said, human activities necessarily result in vehicle trips. And what the traffic engineers did, I mean, look, they came from a branch of engineering called civil engineering, which also deals with water. And if you look at the principles of traffic engineering, they've basically applied the same principles to cars as they apply to water, which is we've got to plan for the peak demand, the biggest flood, and we've got to accommodate as many vehicles as possible. So the problem with that is people are not water. They're more dynamic, 
They make different choices based on the price and availability of things. But because we've turned our city into our city streets, which used to be places for people, into a traffic sewer, where we basically say, oh, the best thing possible is for people, as many vehicles as possible at peak time to travel down this road. And that has impacts on surrounding buildings. Um, it tends to lower the property values. There's not much space here. It's not very pleasant to be a person walking along here, popping into the shops because of the noise and the pollution caused by the traffic. Um, but just a few blocks away, where we have pedestrianized Vulcan Lane, kind of similar buildings, very similar location, but the property values here are much higher because people value the quietness and the space. And actually, this is a place where you're likely to get more foot, tra foot traffic going into your business. So traditional traffic engineering, for understandable reasons, prioritizes the movement of cars rather than looking at what's really important to the economy, which is people and goods. And then there's The High Cost of Free Parking, which is a really fantastic book that I recommend you read. Um, this was written by an economist named Donald Shoup at UCLA, and he studied uh, all the planning regulations because all over the United States, Canada, uh, New Zealand, and Australia, the planning regulations have forced new development to put in large off-street car parks because they assumed that the human activities happening in those buildings would necessarily result in vehicle trips, and the worst thing that could ever happen might be a full car park. So because of this approach to managing parking, parking has become the single biggest land use in many of our urban areas. This is Manukau city center. It's a, meant to be a city center, a place where people live and work and uh, you know trade. Well, all of this blue area is off-street car parking and it's been mandated by the district council. So you can't provide more dwellings and more business without paying a lot of money to put the parking underground. So we've got about four or five empty car parks for every one that's being used in New Zealand. And it creates this beautiful environment, a sign of economic success. Not really, no. And it's also not a nice environment uh, for walking or cycling or taking public transport. In fact, for over 60 years, our transport planning and land use rules focused on moving and storing cars at any cost. And that has made it very difficult to do anything but use a car. Because obviously we've created an environment where people don't feel it's safe for their kids to walk and cycle to school. Um, it's much more difficult to service the trips that people need to take by public transport because basically uh, transportation policy and infrastructure ends up shaping the way land use happens. So in the beginning, in a walking city, you could walk everywhere you needed to go. A transit city happened a little bit later. Auckland used to be a transit city and you can see the bones of that old structure in our shops like the Sandringham shops down Dominion Road, Mount Eden Village, all those little villages sprung up around the tramway stops. And people lived in houses where they could walk to their local shops, buy some things, or jump on the tram and get into the center of town. But after we started prioritizing cars over everything else, suddenly the places we needed to go were further away. And so it's, the truth is, we will never be able to service all of the trips that you currently take in a car by public transport. It would never be viable. But we have a choice to do things differently. Auckland is expecting about a million new residents over the next 30 years, and that is a real opportunity to do things smarter. At the moment, unfortunately, uh, the government isn't spending much money on public transport infrastructure. They aren't spending much money on walking and cycling. They're spending a little bit more on public transport services, but where is most of the money going? New state highways more money is being spent on a few new state highways than anything else in the transport budget. And you can see it in a pie chart, the purple is new state highways, the green is local roads, um, and red is um, public transport. But if you look at infrastructure, it's actually, it's mostly new state highways and local roads a little bit, so our rates will be paying more for our road maintenance and, and local roads, and there's very little going on public transport or walking and cycling. But we could do something different, and that's what this campaign is about. 
we really need to engage the people of Auckland to make their voices heard so we can get the public transport investment that we need to give people rail options. So here's our current rail network. Actually, this, this map's a little bit old. We've actually developed more. So this is the southern rail line. This is the eastern rail line. Uh, this is the western line. And we do have a line to Onehanga now. It's actually going to be the first one to be electrified. And we've got a spur to Manukau City. But at the moment, Britomart is a terminus station. So that means all the trains have to go through Newmarket, and they have to go into Britomart and back out again. And so that seriously limits the capacity of the rail network, because we just can't get more trains through Britomart, because we've got two tracks going in, and basically all the trains have to go in and out of there. So the city rail link is a tunnel that will go underground uh, from Britomart up to Mount Eden Station. There'll be three new stations along uh, the western side of the CBD, so at Aote Square, right here where this office is at uh, K Road, and there'll also uh, be one more at, at Newton. What this will allow by connecting this up here is not just serving people taking the train from Britomart to K Road. The real value of this piece of infrastructure is that it um, allows twice as many trains to run on the network. So that means you can get five minute frequencies. And it also halves the travel time from out west. So if you're in New Lynn, at the moment you have to go all the way through Newmarket, around to Brita Mart, and then walk up to the center of town. With the city rail link, you'll be able to go straight in 23 minutes. That starts to get really competitive with driving. So it's going to attract a lot more people to use the train. Trains are going to be much more frequent and they're going to be faster across the entire network. So it's a way of really unlocking the benefits of the investment that we've made so far in Britomart and in electrification, which is going to roll out over the next few years. There have been a number of studies. Uh, so Auckland Transport's been looking into this for many, many years. The first time the project was mentioned was actually in 1946. Um, it was in the transport plan for Auckland in the 50s. Uh, but more recently, we had a business case in 2010, which was peer-reviewed by the University of California Transportation Center and a number of other um, consultants, and it showed that there were quite good returns. So really, rail has a very long life, and the benefits are increasing over time, um, unlike road projects where they tend to de decrease because more people tend to use the roads. Um, the marginal cost of additional people on the rail network is, is quite low, but while this is a big cost, the benefits to the CBD um, and the entire Auckland region far outweigh the cost. And although the government didn't believe that study because they don't understand how rail networks work or why people might want to take the train, um, so there was another study called the City Center Future Access Study, and that was released just before Christmas. That study looked at 47 different options to deal with congestion in Auckland, and it concluded very clearly that the city rail link was the best option for road users as well as rail users. It was the best way to reduce congestion, so everybody who's still driving is going to benefit more from people being, more people being able to take the train. So um, it's going to double the capacity of the rail network at least. And at the moment, 45,000 people take the train on the weekdays. Uh, so that's a significant reduction in cars on the road. This will make it possible for more than 80 or 90,000 people to take the train. That's the equivalent of 12 lanes of motorway, which we really couldn't build at this point. And even if we did, all those cars would have to find a car park. Um, there's a huge cost associated with that. Um, and people are obviously paying for their vehicles and the fuel to run them. So you don't have to use the train yourself to benefit from it. Even if you work out in East Tamaki, um, you'll probably benefit from more people being able to take the train who aren't headed that way or headed in other directions. More development happening in the city center and around the rail network will also do a lot to reduce the pressure on the road network. Because if we, if we don't develop the rail network, it's not as attractive to go Lynn in a place like New Lynn, and people are going to end up moving out to the far north or south of Auckland and driving into the city. So there's huge benefits for reducing congestion as a million new people come into Auckland by developing the rail network and allowing development to happen at higher densities around that rail network. This is an example of a city that's done it, that we could be like Perth. How many, has anyone been to Perth? 
So Perth is about the same size as Auckland. It's 1.2 million people. It's very spread out. It's very sprawling, uh, high, highly car dependent, like Auckland, high car, car ownership. But they made some different choices to us. So back in the 80s, actually it was about 1991, uh, Perth decided to get rid of their old diesel rail cars. It wasn't worth refurbishing them. So they decided to go ahead and electrify the line and buy electric trains. So they sold Auckland their diesel rail cars, locomotives, and we're still running them until we get our new electric cars um, in a couple of years. But as you can see, electrifying the line, making it a uh, more frequent service, attracted a lot more people to use the train. And then over time, it sort of steadily grew, and they added some new rail lines recently um, in 2007, and we've seen rail patronage just shoot through the roof in Perth. So Auckland's been ticking along, but we've got to do some pretty big investment to get the same sort of step change in Auckland. And we can, because every time we've invested in rail, it's been met with increasing patronage. So well worth it. The City Rail Link is a no-brainer. It's a win for the economy, for people, for the environment, for the future of how Auckland develops. There's been a lot of support in the community for this, from business groups, unions, old people, young people. The only people holding up progress on the city rail link are the central government. So that's why we need you to chip in and help us make this campaign. You can sign up online to get involved in the campaign or just to show your support for making the city rail link happen by 2021. We can do this. Let's make it happen. Let's reconnect Auckland.